just one quick, one quick, real quick announcement. Um, Wednesday night, 6.30, um, we have an academic night. Uh, I promise you the person that's coming in, Del Coulter, um, one of the smartest guys I know, and I, and I mean that sincerely, we went to school together. Um, I, I, I believe he's got some great things to talk about. So if you like academics, intellect, word of God, theology, all of that, you need to be here. Um, and if, you, if you're not here, I just want you to know that you will not go to heaven if you don't show up here Wednesday night at 6.30. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but, but anyway, I would love to have you here. I think it would be a great, a great time. So that, so that being said, I, I was recently um, watching um, some people that were talking about an interview that had happened between some pastors and a missionary. And, you know, they were talking to the missionary and, you know, talking about all the stuff that he did, the stuff that you would normally think about, like, you know, how do you reach people and, you know, how do you deal with culture and how do you do all these things? And, you know, it was, and it was a great interview. And then, and then they just sort of, to, to break up, you know, sort of the, the, the normal sort of interview podcast type thing, they, they just asked a question, sort of tongue in cheek, sort of, you know, fun, saying, hey, when you come back, you know, from, from overseas and you come to America, you know, much like, you know, if you probably, you know, this as well as I do, like if you're in your house, you may have some kids and they may have like some crayons on the wall or there might be some, some cuts in the carpet or whatever, and you just sort of live in your house and you don't really pay attention to them, but somebody else comes in or maybe you're gonna put it up for sale and that next set of eyes comes in and starts seeing all the stuff. You're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that, forgot about it. So they were asking him, hey, when you come back over to America, you probably have a different set of eyes than we do. Um, is there anything that just like drives you nuts? Like when you, when you show up, like you go, these people are not Christians. You know, these people are not living right. And they were joking. It was a sort of tongue in cheek, but they were saying, is there anything that just makes you go, how in, these world, in the world can these people say they're Christians in America and live like this. And, and he was like, yeah, absolutely. There's something that I really see that, that makes me go, what in the world are they doing? And they were like, well, what is it? And when he said the answer, they were like, Whoo. And I remember when I heard the answer, I'm like, whoo, that's a sort of a strange answer until he went on. He said, yeah, he goes, when I come to America, he said, the thing I just don't even, I don't even get is Christians. I, I don't even understand how we do it. He says, it's your storage garages. He says, so I go over to people's house who, who go to church and who love God and support us and they can't even get into their garage because all their stuff is in the garage. Like they can't pull in. And then because they got more stuff, that they take that stuff and they, you have these, sto have you noticed the storage garages? They're on every corner of every city and, and you put your storage stuff in there and half of it's air conditioned. He said, have you not read scripture where it talks about the guy that had the barns and he had more stuff so he tore down his barns and he, put more stuff in his barns. And, and, and that night the Lord said, he actually called him a fool. He said, you fool, do you not know your soul's gonna be required? He goes, your life does not consist in the abundance of things that you have. He said, you Americans, you're greedy and you're selfish. And, and it was like, whoa. I was like, man, okay. And he goes, and I think you might be blind to that. And I was like, man, that's a good story to start off one of the blind spot series. So whether you, you know, because some of you may have storage facilities and you're like going, oh man, I'm not trying to, that does not mean you need to go empty it out tonight. Like, honey, we got to go right now and clean. That's not what he, but, but what he was saying is, is he goes, can you imagine if every American took all the stuff that they had and every storage garage and everything else, and we gave all of that over to the people in the third world countries, how much more they would have and how much more we could solve problems rather than just storing things up. And I think there's a message in there. I think there's, there's something in there that, that maybe we want to explore. And then they asked the, this question. They said, so how do you cure that? How do you, what do you, he goes, well, that's, that's not hard at all. He said, he said it, rather than all about me, he said, you, you, he said, what people need to get a hold of is some generosity because generosity kills greed. You gotta, you gotta learn to be generous. And here, here's what you know, here's what I know, here's what we all know. We can, we can talk about generosity sort of in, 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 a, in like a 30,000 foot level and it's like, eh, okay, yeah, okay, that's fine. I know I gotta be kinder. I know I probably should maybe not keep enough stuff or whatever. But when you get it down to the granular level and then you start talking about being generous with stuff and like maybe having to give up stuff or maybe having to share stuff or actually talking about what's capital one, what's in our wallet, you know, all of a sudden it becomes, it becomes this. It becomes the elephant walks into the room. 
You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Because, because anytime you talk, it's like you can talk about it like in a sweeping, sweeping way, like be more generous, amen. And then you say, well, okay, let's talk a little bit deeper. No, 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 no. Because here's what you know, here's what I know, here's what we all know. Anytime you talk about generosity, and specifically if you get into talking about, do we have too much stuff or could we give some of our stuff or talking about how we give and how we sort of look at finances or whatever else, it's invariably true, you know this and I know this, that somebody in the sanctuary and somebody online, at least one person, is gonna say, all churches want is your money. Let me, can, I, can I push back on that for a minute? We're not a bank. Like, we don't, to be honest with you, we, we never even think about money, really, as, as people on a church staff. You know what we think about? We think about your kids. We got 80 or 90 kids right now on a youth retreat. We're praying for them that they come back so filled with the spirit of God. We pray for your marriages. We're worried about how things are going for you. We got prayer chains going on. We're thinking about ministry. The only time we ever think about this is if we have to say, yeah, we can't do that because we can't afford it. That would be the only time that we think about this. And so I wanna push back on that because what this, what this does is it creates a culture in church. And you know this, and I know this, because it's just true. It's a culture where, we, because this goes on and because it's a sensitive issue, pastors don't wanna talk about it and you don't wanna hear about it. And so it becomes this icky situation. But what's interesting is, is all of you tell me all the time, you say, Chip, we are so glad we come to a church that teaches and preaches the word of God. Like we just love it when you go into the background. We love it when you go deep. We love it when you show us Jesus in the Old Testament and all of this stuff. So listen to me, if you say you really love me teaching the Bible, then one of the things about it that's in the Bible and it's really a lot in there is how we should be generous. It's like all through scripture. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't be this icky thing. And just, just to push back on this, let, let, me, let me just give you some, some biblical references here. Paul talking to the Ephesians elders in Acts 20. He says, in all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. Like what a different perspective Paul had. I'm gonna work hard so I can help others. But most people think of I'm gonna work hard so I can get more stuff and get a storage garage, I'm just kidding, um, you know, or whatever, you know, keep doing. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. The, 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 the psalmist says, it is well with the man who deals generously in lands, who conducts his affairs with justice. Solomon says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, like the Lord doesn't need anything from you and me. He says, you lend to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. This is, a, this is a tough one. John, the beloved disciple, he says, if anyone has a storage garage, no, no, okay, no, if anyone, that's not Greek either. Anyway, so if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and he closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? He's not saying you're not a Christian. Because Christians, we can be greedy. We can be selfish from time to time. He's just saying, man, it shouldn't be that way because if God's love is really in our heart, we should be generous. The writer to the Hebrews says, don't neglect to do good and share what you have. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it's hard to share with you because you don't have a whole lot. You go, oh, I don't know if I share, am I gonna have anything? He says, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. In other words, like the, the idea of giving and, and sharing and being generous, th these are biblical truths. Jesus says it pretty clear. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, so let, me, let me say this at a, at, a, at, a, at a granular level here, because I wanna make sure that we hear this, because this is so important. We can't let some poor communication and or bad teaching about giving. And I've had both in my life. I've, ha I've, been, I've been made miserable about it. I've been made feel guilty about it. Like, you know, oh, and I've had bad teaching. I've had people, you know, get, give here and, you know, all your warts will be gone. And give here and you won't have gr hair grow out of your ear. Give here and you'll be cured of whatever. Give here and you'll have a big plank or whatever. That's, look, we can't let some poor communication in or bad teaching about giving. And maybe you grew up in a church or you knew somebody that didn't steward money well or, or, or they just didn't seem like it was right. We can't let teaching about giving that's poor and or some churches or people who were or are bad stewards keep us from living out biblical truth. We just can't do it. And it's so easy to, to go, yeah, but there's this, this and I, I agree. 
Like I've been in churches, I was at church one time and I think they took up like seven offerings. It was like, man, what in the world is going on? You know, I mean, it was crazy. You, you don't wanna do that, I don't wanna do that. We don't do that here. We don't even take up an offering. Like we don't even pass anything. We're just like, well, if you wanna give, give. I mean, so it's not like we're like some oppressive regime here, but what we don't wanna do is we don't want to let the ideas of biblical generosity steal from us the things that God has for you and me. God, God doesn't need it. It's not what he wants from us. It's what he wants for us because generous people are happier. Generous, generous people have bigger smiles. Generous people realize it's better to give than it is to receive. And so as a church, we've just decided we're gonna be generous in everything that we do. We, we, we do things like this. And this is, like if, you, if, if you support the local church here, this is stuff that you, you're supporting, whether you know it or not. We, we, we do serve day. We do hugs and smiles back to school. We, we give age appropriate school supplies to kids that would not probably be able to get them because of where they, they live or because they don't have the money to do it. We support these things. We do things on Main Street, Waterside, Farmer's Market. We do stuff at Resurrection House and, and Feed the Poor. We do all kinds of stuff around here. We spend a ton of money doing that, we're, but we're not done. We, we don't just do these things that are good intentional neighbor things. We support various organizations that do what they do really good. And they would tell you that if Grace didn't support them, they would know it. In fact, we've been given plaques many, many years. We get plaques from different one of these groups that you were the best partner we had last year. We, we, we support things like Youth for Christ. And let me just say this too. People all around, you know, there'll be a chip, you need to speak up on issues and you need to say more. Can I tell you something? I, I'm tired of listening to people talk about things and do nothing about it. You know what we we do, we don't talk about it, we do it. We, we do it. You wanna, you, wanna know, you wanna know what this church believes? Look at what we support. We support Youth for Christ. We support Sarasota Medical Pregnancy Center. Women who have, who have children that they maybe didn't expect or don't know what to do with, we, we support them and pour in them. We support them to solve maternity homes so these women can have these children and they have, they have support groups and whatever. This is what we support. We don't have to talk about it, we do it, okay? We're better together and, and, and bridge a life. We take care of foster kids and, and help them take care of these foster kids and, and pour into this. Um, say law freedom where people have been abused sexually, we pour into that. Needles to nails, drug addicts that have been saved and set free by Jesus, care porter, portal. This is, this is what we do. Th this is who we are. We're not going to not be a generous church because somebody back in my life or somebody in somebody else's life did it wrong because the fact of the matter is being generous is biblical. It's just Biblical, not only that, but here's some of the missionaries that we support and here's where they're at. We support these people. We, anything, if they need something, we get it for them. We have a missions department and, and, and we take care of these people. Like when, when you give here, like we're generous. We, we, we take care of people and, and we, we support, we got people in counseling that we take care of. We got, I mean, we, the things that we do around here, there's so many things that go on here that I can't even keep up with. Just, this, just, just, just a few hours ago, we had about 80 women that have lost children in, in pregnancy that came in here and, and met for the whole day and wrote names of their children's down that they've lost and were ministered to. Right before that, just a couple of days before that, the Lakewood Ranch Business Association was in here and we were helping them do things and whatever. I mean, it's just amazing what goes on because as Christians, we just should be people that are generous. It just should be who we are and it shouldn't be icky. It shouldn't be something, oh man, whatever the giving message, whatever, it's not icky. So I wanna share from my heart to you because you all say, hey, we love it when, when you we teach the Bible. I mean, you say that, and then if I teach it something the way you don't like it, then you're like, oh, I don't know about this guy. But anyway, um, and, 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 here, and here's the thing. I always say this, you don't have to agree with me. I'm fine with that. Like I'm, I'm totally, totally settled in, in where I'm at with the Lord and, and what I do. And the one I got to please is him. And so I, I'm just gonna be faithful to what I know. I'm gonna be faithful to scripture and tell you what I've learned over the years and what I've seen over the years and what I believe scripture says about these things. And I just ask you to lean in. You, you, if you go, ah, okay, yeah, some of that was okay, great. If you go, wow, that was really cool, great. You know, and I'll know because the ones that walked past me at the at door, like this, I don't know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't do something good. No, I'm, not, I'm just kidding, if you, it's all good. So let me, let me tell you what I've learned along the way. First of all, being generous is a part of following Jesus. It, it shouldn't be, a, like we shouldn't be people that are not known as generous. You know what's sad? It's sad. You go to restaurants and you say, so 
who are the worst tippers? They say, well, the Sunday afternoon crowd that comes from church. That's, that's a shame. That's sad. Can we just have a moment here? Can I just sit down and say, that's sad. I mean, that's sad. Love on the waitress at Chili's, man. Goodness gracious. That's where I found my wife, Mindy, was at Chili's. She was a server, <laughs> telling you. You don't know what, you know, if you're generous, you don't know what you're gonna come up with. I mean, just, just, be, just be generous. Find your wife over some nachos and cheese and a tip. You know, I mean, you know, just be generous. Okay, it's, so it's a part of following Jesus. You see it here. Paul says, he says, Jesus says that it's more blessed to give than receive. We should just be now, like it shouldn't be, there should never be an icky moment for a pastor to get up and say, hey, we, we ought to be generous. We ought to be more generous than the world. We ought to be more generous than other people. They should know that, hey man, those people, they go above and beyond. Second thing that I can tell you biblically, and I've learned um, it, it, throughout my life is that generosity is one of the easiest ways to determine our commitment to the Lord. People don't usually like this one. They don't, they don't like this thing. You, you, you wanna know what's going on. You wanna know where your commitment is. Pull out your checkbook and look where you give. You, you'll figure out real quickly where you, you go, well, I don't, I don't agree with that. I, 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 okay, well, John says that if we have this world's good and we don't, if we're not generous, he asks the question, how does God's love abide in us? In other words, to John, it's a big deal. If you're unwilling to be generous, it's a sign that something is not right. Doesn't mean you're not a Christian and nobody's trying to give you any guilt. The name of the church is not guilt community church, it's grace community church, all right? Nobody's trying to give anybody a hard time, just trying to talk about biblical things. Jesus says something that's, that's really fascinating. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think most of us think that we think that where our heart is, that's where we will treasure. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, our heart follows our treasure. Look at, look at, look at what you treasure. Look at what you give time to, and that's what your heart goes to. And you wanna know how you know that that's where your heart goes to? Because if somebody messes with it, you're upset because it has your heart. You know, I say to people all the time, you know, if you're in a marriage, treasure your spouse and your heart will follow. Don't watch The Bachelor. Don't watch those programs on TV because they try to tell you what's in your heart first and then that's not the way it works. Sometimes you, you gotta pour into somebody else and then those feelings will come. You know, people go, oh, you know, it's not the way it was when we first started dating. I'm like, dating is like half a joke anyway because you, you're putting on a show for the person, you get married and then the real person comes out, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy how we're like, oh, it didn't change. I mean, no, but what I'm saying is, is that, that, that where, where what we treasure is what gets our heart. And a great way to look at where our heart is, is just look at what we're committed to in our giving. It's a great place to look. I'm not saying it's the only place. I'm just saying it's a great place to look. Third thing that I've learned, and I think this is true, there's different levels to our generosity. And I've seen this across the board. And I probably could pull some scriptures and support all this in, in, in some way or fashion. I'm not gonna try to get into just doing some topical message and pull stuff together, but this is just true. Christians, they, they, they come to the Lord, they get, they get saved, and they just sort of know, well, I'm, I probably should be different in some way. And, and, and many of us are, you know, maybe if you're newer to Christian, you just sort of don't know what to do. And it comes to giving, you know, normally we <laughs> hold on to everything that we can get. And so it's sort of strange. What, what I've learned is, is just to watch sort of the, the walk. We, we call it the journey of generosity around here. You know, what do you want to join in and, and walk because it's, it's not something where you just step in and you're all in right away. I mean, it's usually something that people learn along the way and they learn to trust God and they wade in a little bit more. And here's the way I found it. I mean, typically you start off, you're not really much of a giver. Now, some people, they come to Christ and they're already givers. So that's, that's a whole other story. But most people, you know, sort of hold that, that's pretty sacred, their, their, their income and, and, and so on and so forth or whatever it may be. And, and so the first level I, I, I find in, in almost anybody that starts to maybe, maybe, maybe give and not even just a church, just being generous in, in nature is, is tipping. It's sort of like, you know, yeah, that was, that was maybe, <laughs> I got something from that, so I'll do whatever. Yeah, I've been coming to the church for like six months. I probably drank like 400 gallons of their coffee. They probably deserve two bucks. You know, I'll put it in the, the box or whatever. And, and listen, can I say something to you? I want you to hear this from me. I, I, I love anybody who does anything that's generous. You, you have my heart because, you know, this is one of those sermons. 
If I were to preach on patience, I would go, yeah, I'm really a bad, bad example of patience. I'm a very impatient person. I'm always like, go, 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 we can do it. But when it comes to giving, like I, I, that, that's, a, that's something that I excel at. I love to give. I, I'm, I'm a generous person. So this is, this is an easy sermon for me to preach. But for some people, it's, it's tough. And I get it. So you start off tipping. If you sort of get into the tipping thing, the next thing you do is you find that people will start to maybe give a little bit more occasionally. There's a little bit more than just the tip that they just start to think about more occasionally. Occasional, and you see it, they maybe see somebody at the gas station and maybe they go, ah, you know, maybe I'll help them out or whatever, or in church, you might, ah, you know, I probably ought to give something, you know, along the way. The, the, the next step moves into intentional. And, and this is probably where most seasoned Christians um, in church actually are is, is sort of intentional in their giving. They, they may say, you know, I'm gonna give the church, you know, $10 every week or $50 every week or $100 every week, or whatever it may be. And trust me, we're so f- delighted that you join us in, in, in being generous. And then maybe on the outside, you maybe got compassion, a compassion kid that you, you know, have or whatever, a charitable thing that you do at the end of the year. But you start to become more intentional in your giving. It starts to be like, yeah, that's, that's important. Now, this next one is one that gets everybody all spooked out and everything. I, I, I'm gonna come back around to it. I got two slides. I wanna really talk about this. I wanna make sure that you understand <clears throat> what this is and where it's coming from and what the Bible has to say. But I find the next step after somebody's intentional, that the next step somewhere along the way, they decide, to, to be someone who is a tither. And we'll explain this in a minute. If you've never heard that word, that's a word gets everybody been out of shape in church, by the way. Um, it's like, it's crazy. Say tither, you go, ah! You know, it's like, it's like a horror film. It's like, what did I say? You know, um, <clears throat> and so, and, and what I find is, is people who become tithers very quickly go into above and beyond. In other words, they, 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 they give their 10%, but they're so quickly to move on to other things. It seems like it's moving from intentional to tithing to above and beyond is a very, very quick um, movement once people understand the journey of generosity. And then where you really wanna get to in life is to be a lifestyle giver, where you just, that's just, that's just who you are. You just, you're like Paul, you gotta work so that I can be a blessing. You know, and that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy life. And if you have a storage garage, I'm not giving you a hard time. I'm just saying that that, that, that these are the things. So so now this this tithing thing, let's let's talk about this because, and and you don't have to agree with me, it's fine. It's just gonna tell you where I'm coming from and what I think and what Mindy and I practice, what our family practices and how we we do what we do. Um, I think Christians should be tithers. You go, oh no, I don't, I don't believe in that. I, I don't, I'm not whatever. Well, okay, that's fine. Let me first of all explain what it is, and then we'll talk about some biblical rationale because that's what we do here. We teach the Bible, not just what Chib believes. Um, it's, it's what Scripture teaches, and so I'll tell you where I get there and how I get there and all that stuff. And if you do go, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't agree. It's fine. It's fine. We just, I just want to teach you on giving because I think giving is something to teach about. J- just so that you know, the, the first tithing is the first ten percent of our income should go to the local church. You go, hold on, how, 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 how do you figure that out? How do you, how do you okay, well. If you, if you, we're going to talk about this. I'm going to show you how this works in the New Testament and how that, how we get that. Um, in the Old Testament, what they would do is, is the first ten percent is they would trust God. I mean, j- just think about this. Many of you, when you go to a restaurant, you tip fifteen or twenty percent. Some of you do more than that. So. Ten percent is not a big number. Like it's just not a big number. It's just for whatever it is, it's just a big number when it comes to church. But like we'll pay six percent sales tax and not think a thing about it. But somebody mentioned something. Oh no, don't talk about so. Ten percent of our income should go to the local church because in the Old Testament they would give ten percent. And, and it would go to the temple and it would allow the priests to do the things that they needed to do. In the New Testament, you can read Cyprian and Tertullian and all these early church people. You can go back and read their, they, they believed in tithing. They, that's what they did. The, the church was given 10%. So they you know, sort of trusting God with your finances, just like you trust God with your family, you trust God with your marriage. Just so can you talk about marriage and you go, hey, marriage is not about you getting your needs met. It's about you meeting the other person's need. And people go, oh, I don't wanna do that. I don't believe in 1 Corinthians 7. I watch TV programs and they teach me something different. No, that's what the Bible says. You, you serve your spouse. It's the first one to wash feet. You go, I don't want to do that. Okay, but that's just the way God says to do it. I don't know why God's, I mean, to me personally, that God says 10%, I'm like, man, he gave me 90%. That's a deal. Like that's, that's, that's like awesome. Okay, if it was just to show you how badly this is done, okay, 5% of Christians tithe. 5%. So we either don't believe it, which I think that's probably the, number one deal, or we just don't do it, which is also there. Just to give you an idea so that everybody's aware, if, if that number were more, like the churches in America would be able to kill it, you know, um, and it's not. But let me give you th- this stat here. Christians give 2.5% of their income. That doesn't, 2.5%, not to the local church, 2.5% 
total, like some of it to the church, some of it here, some of it there. Okay, just to give you some perspective, Christians gave 3.3% of their income during the Great Depression. So we've changed, we've slid into some, some more stuff. And so whenever you get here and you talk about this, here's, here it is, because we've done this for so long, here's, here's what happens. People say, Chip, tithing isn't a New Testament thing because we aren't under the law. Yeah, we're not under the law. We've never said that here. The, the, it's not law, community church. It's not, you know, it's not, it's grace. We, we believe that 100%. The problem though with this thinking, because this is what people say, it's, it's just not, it's not a New Testament thing. It's just not there. Okay, the, the problem is, is that tithing predates the law. See, that, this is the problem biblically, because I'm not trying to give you a hard time, not maybe knowing the scriptures the way that we should. We don't, we don't realize this. Tithing is before Charlton Heston took them across. I mean, <laughs> Moses took them across, I mean, to the promised land. Okay, because we know that Abraham tithed in Genesis 14, 20. We know that Jacob tithed in 28, 22. Tithing is something that people were doing before the law. So, so it's not like when you say, well, it, it's part of, it's, it, it is in the law, but it was before the law. It's like saying loving your neighbors in the law, but to love people was before the law. So when you, when you use that as an excuse, and, and I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna be blunt and I'm, you can get mad at me or whatever. I've never met anybody who says that, well, tithing's not in the New Testament. We, just, we shouldn't be tithing. I've never met anybody that says, okay, well, I, it's not, but I give 30%. No, it's always a justification to give less. It's just the bottom line. I've never met anybody who says, I don't believe tithing's new tithing, but I, we give way more than that. And I would love to meet that person because that would be great. Because I, I, think, I think if you will agree with me, we don't sing, I surrender 10%, right? So I surrender all, right? So, I mean, so, so, so we say, well, the New Testament, okay. Or, or we say, well, Jesus didn't teach tithing. So, so, all right, so Jesus didn't teach. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the words of red. The problem is though, is he did. He did teach tithing. You go, oh, oh. He did? Yeah, I'm gonna read it to you. Think I'm like, make it up? I've been your pastor this long and you think, oh, Chip's gonna just make up the Bible. No, I'm gonna read it to you. Okay, Matthew 23, talking to the religious people. He says, woe to you scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These, your tithing of your mint, your dill, and your cumin, you, 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 even the smallest little things in your God, you all are meticulous in your giving. Good job. He goes, you should have done those things. No, no, no problem with that. But you shouldn't have neglected the others. The NLT, the New Living Translation says it this way. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe Yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So you say, oh, okay, all right, so Jesus taught it, but okay, well, that was before he went to the cross, though. So when he went to the cross, after he went to the cross, all that's gone. Okay, well, the problem is, in the book of Hebrews, in chapter seven, tithing is taught again. And what's interesting in the book of Hebrews, when it mentions tithing, the book of Hebrews is about how Jesus is better than all the things in the Old Testament. He's better than the angels in chapter one. He, he's better than Moses, chapter two and three. He's, he's better than Melchizedek. He's better than the Aaronic priesthood. He's better than the old covenant. But in chapter seven, when it talks about tithing, that would have been the great place for the writer that he was going. And by the way, that's superseded. And here's the new deal. He doesn't, which is striking. And then you start looking at the early church and the early church talks about it. All the early church writings that we have that are not biblical, but just early church, early history, the Christians, they tithe. They supported the local church. This is what they, they did. So then about this point, somebody goes, well, I just don't believe in tithing. That's fine. It's, it's not like it's a heaven or hell issue here. It's just, I mean, it's, you're not gonna get saved or not saved, but whether you do, but my question would be, and I mean this sincerely, well then what do you believe about generosity? What do you believe as a Christian about generosity? Because I can tell you this, grace always does more. You read through the New Testament and you talk about the Old Testament, Jesus says, oh, no, 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 no. It said that, let me tell you what's really going on. It says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yeah, don't resist the evil person. You go, whoa, that's, that's more. Yeah, grace always says more. So if you're gonna say, I don't believe in tithing, you don't believe in that at all. Well, then my question is, what do you believe in as a believer? Do you believe that, that 
you should just like not give and not be generous? I, I don't think that we can agree with that. I think, I think we know better than that. So the next thing I wanna say, and this is important too, is biblical tithing is not the same thing as charitable giving. And I think we've made it this way. Okay, and this is super important. Please hear me here. Please hear me. Nowhere in the Bible are we told that we give a tithe. You know what Malachi says? Bring. You know why you can't give it? It's not yours. It's not mine. It's the Lord's. He doesn't say give it. He says, bring it. Bring me the tithe so that there may be food in my house. Bring the tithe so that there can be ministry done. And then then he says this, and I know this has been butchered, butchered, but it still is biblical and true. And people have made it into something that it's not. But he says, put me to the test. I mean, isn't, isn't that what God says about everything? You, you, wanna, you wanna pray? Pray, watch what I can do. You wanna, you wanna share your faith? Watch how I use you to lead people to the Lord. You, everything is a step of faith. God says, trust me with what I'm telling you to do. G- give, give me the 10% and watch what I do. Watch what I do. What, look at how I'll take care of you. And, and, and I'm telling you, although I know people take this and they abuse it and they're like, you know, put $100 in here and you're gonna get $15,000 back and that's crazy and it's not true and it's not biblical. What I can tell you is, and hear your pastor here, you cannot outgive God. Period, end of story. No matter what we believe about this. I'll also tell you that we should be givers above and beyond tithing. So, so the early church tithed, but in 1 Corinthians 16, they need to take up an offering for another project. You gotta take up an offering for the, 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 the saints that are suffering in Jerusalem. Here's how Paul writes. He says, concerning the collection for the saints, I'm gonna collect money here in Corinth, I'm gonna take it to Jerusalem. As I directed to the churches of Galatia, Galatia, so you also are to do, I just love it. Paul's like, this is what you do. He doesn't even go, hey, can we get together and let me try to explain. He's just like, no, this is who we are, man. We just, we give. This is what you do. And here's what he tells them to do. He says, on the first day of every week, this is what I want you to do. He says, each of you is to put something aside. This is after you've given 10%. Put something aside, store it up, put it in a jar, do whatever. As you may prosper, you can't give something that you don't got. But every week, see if God's blessed you, put a little aside. He says, the reason is so that I don't have to get up and give a speech when I show up that there'll just be money because that's what we do. We're Christians. We, we, we go above and beyond. And, and so when it comes to generosity, I just, I think that we need to like chill on being upset or frustrated or whatever else. I just think we need to go, yeah, you know what? That's true. The Bible is true. And, and whether you believe exactly the, exactly the way that I believe or not, that's okay. I'm not here to give you, you don't, have to, you don't have to be me. I'm just telling you though, there's no way in the world that we can be Christians and not believe that being generous is something that we shouldn't be. So people ask me all the time, they say, how can we help? You know, and we do this. We'll preach messages and say, we need golf cart drivers. We'll, we'll say, hey, we need help doing this. We need, we need help doing this. So if you ask me, you said, Chip, what can we do? How can we respond to this message? Okay, first of all, um, be, con- be a consistent tither or be consistent in your generosity as a percentage giver. You say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't like that tithe thing. Um, I, I'm gonna set my own percentage between me and God. Great, set, set your percentage between you and God, but just be consistent because I'm telling you, you, you don't know God will bless you. And I'm not talking about just being here, like be consistent here, but, but be a giver outside of this church. Be, be, be a giver that, that you say, how can we help? Just, I'm teaching you the best I can about generosity. You need to go home and you need to pray about it. And you need to think about it, but, but maybe, maybe trust God a little bit more with your finances and, and, and in every way being generous. Second thing you can do, and this is huge, is we have a current need that we would like for you to help us with. When you leave here, you're gonna get one of these. Please don't take this and throw it in the trash can, please. Don't do that. And, and, and inside, you're gonna have a letter that, that I have written and don't start and go, thank you. Uh, don't, don't do that. And don't, don't do it in the car. Like when you're at the stoplight and try to read, don't do that. Don't even open this up till you go home. Sit down and say, God, I'm gonna open this up. I'm gonna read this. You're gonna read this letter and it's gonna tell you about some things that you could help us with. And there's gonna be a nice little thing because we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna start a campaign. It's gonna be called the Lighthouse Campaign. And it's, it's to, we're, we're, we're building out this area over here. We're closing on this property. We're, we're getting ready to put parking spots here. And let me tell you something. We, we don't need one penny from anybody to do it. We, we already got the money. We can do it. 
But what we'd like to do is, is we'd like to not use that capital so that when we get all these things done, we can go back and start doing other things that we desperately need to do as we continue to grow. So you're gonna have a letter. The letter has a nice little QR code. The QR code's right here. You can take it with your phone and scan it. And there's a video where I talk about a lot of things. I'd like for you to listen to that. And then we've given you a little card here and we're just saying, hey, if you, you, you can fill it out, you can drop it in, you can, you can email it, you can skip, just, you know, and you can throw it away if that's what you wanna do. But just ask the Lord if, if, if he would be, if this is something that you could help us with. And it would be incredible if, if you would. And we're gonna do this over the next 52 days. The reason for 52 days is because that's how long it took Nehemiah to build the wall. We may not raise everything that we wanna raise. We, we may not, who knows, but we, we're gonna trust God. We're just asking you to help us. So, so you, you wanna know how you can help us? We don't, we don't do this very much. And C.S. Lewis says it best. I don't believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. That's what C.S. Lewis says. And I, and I agree with C.S. Lewis when it comes to giving. And the last thing I would tell you is this, is let us all agree to never lose sight of why we do what we do. We called this the Lighthouse Campaign and that room's gonna be called the Lighthouse is because at least once a year, I read you a story. And I'm gonna read you the story again this weekend. And if you've been here, you've heard it. If you have never been here, it'll be the first time that you hear it. Um, but we can't forget why we do what we do because this is not about the church wants your money. This is about, we wanna reach more people. We wanna do more events. We wanna do more ministry. That's what we wanna do. We wanna reach more people. So here's, here's the thing, we'll, we'll read this, I'm gonna pray. They're gonna come out and sing a great song about how doing it God's way is better than our way. And then you can just turn your head at me on the way out and come back next weekend and I'll have a great message that you'll love and you know the elephant won't be in the room. On a dangerous sea coast, where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea and with no thought of themselves, went out day and night tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little station, so it became famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort to support of its work. New boats were bought, new crews trained, the little life-saving station grew. Some of the members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and so poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it as sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in this club's decoration, and there was a liturgical lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large sea was wrecked off the coast. The hired crews brought in boatloads of cold and wet and half drowned people. They were dirty and sick and had different color skin. The beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before they came inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed they were called a life-saving station. But they were voted down and told that if they wanted to save the lives of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. They did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club and yet another life-saving station was found. History continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that sea coast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. We cannot forget what we're doing here. We, we are here to reach people. And what we wanna do is we want to reach people. And all I'm asking you is, is in the same way that I teach 
every single weekend about things that you love and things that you walk out saying, man, that was awesome or whatever. You should walk out and go, you know what? Thank, thank God that our pastor ta- taught us about giving because that's a biblical thing. And, and we should be appreciative that, 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 that he cares enough to preach the whole counsel of the word of God. Because what happens is if, if you don't learn about generosity, you, you, you're robbed, not us. You're, you're robbed. And, and, I, and, I, and I just want you to hear me that the more generous that we can be, and the more we can be into what we're doing, the more we'll watch God continue to do the things that he does. And just so that you know, over like 70 to 80 people in the last six or seven weeks were baptized. The average church in America is like 70 people. We baptized a whole church because of what God is doing in this place. And hear me, when, when, when you give here, You're supporting all of that. God knows that, whether it's a dollar or whether whatever it is. And so I just, I would ask you humbly to to think about this, take those things home, pray about it, pray about this. Um, And you know, the good thing is you can go, all right, he ain't gonna talk about that for a long time again. And I I, I won't. So, you know, I mean, but every once in a while, it was, was, when I was watching, I was like, yeah, I need to talk about this. this. This needs to be talked about.